Hello, everybody. Welcome to In Conversation with a Survivor speaker series. Whether you've joined us here for previous sessions or if it's your first time joining us, welcome. We are thrilled to have you as part of this important programming. My name is Daniela Lurion. I'm the Tour for Humanity Director, as well as part of the education team here at the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies. I want to begin this afternoon by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are currently on. While we do meet today in a virtual setting, please do take a moment to consider the importance of the lands and waters that feed our bodies and souls. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral lands and territories of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who call this land home. As we're getting ourselves started, I'll also remind everybody to please keep their videos off and their mics muted. This program is being recorded and will be available for further viewing later on this week. I'm proud today to be joined by Michael Levitt, FSWC President and CEO, Hannah Marazzi from the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, and of course, our wonderful guest speaker for today, Dr. Robert Krell. We do welcome questions, so please feel free to send them at your leisure right directly to me as host here using the chat function on Zoom. We'll do our best to address as many of them as possible, time depending. As we begin this afternoon, Hannah will offer opening remarks. Hannah Marazzi currently serves as Special Advisor to the Honorable Erwin Kotler, Canada's inaugural Special Envoy for Preserving Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Antisemitism. Previously, she served with the United Nations, the National Think Tank CARDIS, and also as a board member for Matthew House Ottawa, a refugee shelter and community furniture bank located in our nation's capital. Welcome, Hannah. Thank you for being here. Well, the thanks is all mine. Uh, Dr. Krell has been someone that uh, I have had the privilege of uh, looking to and learning from for quite a while. Dr. Krell, I don't know if you remember this, but when I was 24 years old, you took the time to sit down with me in uh, your Holocaust Education Center and to explain the work that you did and what led you into it and to show me about the work that you and your team were doing to ensure that never again truly meant never again. And so I've never forgotten that I was 24 and it uh, really shaped how I um, understood Canada and understood the leaders like yourself um, who have been guiding guiding us along the way. So I wanted to begin by thanking Friends of Simon Wiesenthal for this series. It is so key. I think now more than ever, we need to understand where we've come from in order to understand where we're going. And we have uh, the opportunity to learn from wise voices like Dr. Krell's Professor Kotler wishes to pass along his regrets. He so wishes that he could be with you today. Um, but Dr. Krell is a uh, esteemed friend and, and colleague and someone that uh, he has worked alongside and, and learned from. So he says that he knows that you will be in, in good hands. So without further ado, um, would you join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Krell? What a privilege it is to uh, learn from and, and listen to you today. Your story and your life is our gift. Thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you for inviting me on to this uh, very important program. Uh, as always, I must begin at the beginning. The, um, the story that uh, uh, pursues me in life began on August 5, 1940, uh, in The Hague, Holland. I was born in a hospital that had already been confiscated in part by the Gestapo. Uh, they, of course, the German army had invaded Holland on May 10th. And so August uh, was already uh, two months into the war and after the surrender of uh, Holland to the Germans. The uh, first two years of life are largely out of my awareness and were filled in by other adults. But uh, as I will tell you later, my memory kicked in quite early. But in those first two years, 1940 to 1942, it was a brutal occupation by the Germans and the particular brutality was directed to uh, the Jewish community. Uh, Jews were uh, forbidden to 
own radios and bicycles. Uh, they were no longer allowed in their professions. Uh, they were excluded from the social aspects of life, uh, uh, including going to the beach or sitting on park benches. Uh, Jews could only go to grocery stores in the late afternoon when there was nothing left. And each of those uh, sanctions uh, that was building up uh, through a tremendous crescendo uh, went, uh, went uh, relatively unnoticed uh, in the sense that no one could quite believe this was happening. Uh, Holland was a uh, relatively sophisticated country and one that uh, had not suffered uh, Jewish, anti-Jewish pogroms. Uh, so Jews there were so integrated into Dutch society that they, they uh, barely could believe what was happening. Fortunately, uh, my father did believe. And the reason that he believed was that uh, in May, when the deportation started in seriousness uh, to Westerbork, a transit camp in Groningen in Northern Holland, uh, he realized that none of his friends who reported for resettlement to the East, the euphemism that was used uh, for getting rid, of, getting rid of Jews out of Holland, <clears throat> he realized that none had come back and he grew suspicious. And so when on uh, August 19th, 1942, uh, my parents received a letter stating that we should report for resettlement to the east at a certain place, an Umschlagsplatz, a gathering place. Uh, they uh, picked me up, their baby, and off they went in search of uh, hiding places. Uh, everything was left behind within an hour. If you can imagine flight like that, I know that uh, if you flee a burning home, uh, you certainly go and get your photo albums and some other precious items. This was not possible for Jews. Photo albums were the worst. They could identify you immediately. Uh, so we left with nothing. I was placed temporarily with a former neighbor, <clears throat> a kind lady who agreed to take me for a couple of weeks and a miracle happened. One day while I was with her, a uh, lady came by, Violetta Manik. They were friends. She came on her annual social visit and said, who is that baby? And uh, Mrs. Mulder said, that's uh, Robbie Kell. He's a little Jewish boy and his mom is looking for a hiding place for him. And I agreed to take him for a couple of weeks, but uh, me and my elderly father are... Uh, going to be sent out to the countryside pretty soon. I can't keep it much longer. And Violetta Munich at that instant became my mother, my Christian mother. She took me uh, saying that she would keep me for a few weeks also. And I stayed with them for uh, closer to two and a half years. Uh, so that was uh, the first miracle of my uh, very young life. And of course, it is at that time that my memory kicked in. So let me say something about memory because people don't trust children's memories uh, very much. <clears throat> the fact is that we're expected to live our first, say, four or five years of life relatively unencumbered uh, in a degree of comfort, uh, with uh, warmth and love and uh, food and all these things. And actually that leads to not having very much to remember. And most people, when I, when I became a psychiatrist and I'd ask someone who's 35 years old, if they could tell me of their earliest memories, could think back to about age five or six. Uh, perhaps a uh, uh, kindergarten teacher had made an impression on them or they remembered a birthday party. Uh, in our case, the case of the Jewish children, things were happening. 
as in these 35 year olds, if something had happened to them, say uh, surgery for uh, uh, tonsillitis at uh, age three, that, that might stick with them. The things that were happening around me were stickable. Uh, I was given away by my parents. Almost immediately after, my father came to visit me, and I remember this visit very well, because he was teaching me to call him uncle. In Holland, uh, it is uh, very acceptable to call someone uncle who's close to the family, but not necessarily family. He was distancing me from him, so I wouldn't be able to identify him. Uh, why do I remember it so vividly? I leaned again against his chest while he was telling me this, and I felt a gun in his inside pocket. He denied me that memory 20, 30, 40 years later when I recalled it to him. I said, I knew I was in danger because I felt your gun. Now, it was so rare for a Jew to have a gun that, that that already didn't make sense. The fact that I was under two and a half and didn't know what a gun was, also unusual. But the fact is, it left an imprint on my back that I can feel to this day. What was that all about? So when I told my father after the war that I felt that gun, he said, not possible. I never kept that gun in an inside pocket. I kept it in my outside jacket for easy access. Two weeks later, he apologized, called me and he said, you were right. He said, that day I knew my habit was to fling my jacket onto a chair. I was afraid the gun would fall out. So I kept my jacket on and put it in my inside pocket. Uh, what's interesting about that is that I had to fight for my memory, and uh, I will tell you a little later about the fact that most child Holocaust survivors have had to fight for their memories in later years as well. My father had, this was his last visit, and had he been caught, I would never have seen him again. I settled in with the Munichs, very lucky. A wonderful man, Albert Munich, became my father, Violetta Munich, my mother, and Nora Munich, my 10 year old, 10 year older sister at age 12, I was two, uh, became my sister and a very loving one. Of course, she was thrilled, as most 12 year old uh, girls might have been at that time, to have a little brother to look after. And indeed, she looked after me very well, except for the time when she nearly got all of us killed. Nora um, went to school, Christian girl. They could go to school, Jews couldn't. And uh, she would come home from school uh, around three o'clock and uh, teach me how to read and write at a very early age and paid a great deal of attention to me. She was wonderful. One day, I find myself in a baby carriage pushed by Nora out on the streets and uh, with no idea where we're going. We come to a viaduct that is partly underwater and uh, a German soldier walks up to us and I immediately pull the cover over my head. And again, I can feel that tactile feeling as well, still to this day. He helps us cross through the viaduct which is underwater to the other side. I know we're in danger. He happened to be uh, performing a kind act. And after that, my memory stops. 30, 40 years later, I'm talking to Nora. I say, Nora, remember that day that we uh, went out, uh, me and the baby buggy, you pushing me, where were we going? She says, never happened, boy. Didn't have a young itcha, little boy. Uh, that bothered me a great deal because it was such a strong piece of my memory. A few weeks later, she calls 
And she says, uh, you were right. I was taking you to your mother. I said, why in the world were you doing that? How did you know her address? No one was supposed to know where she was. She was in hiding in a small apartment, another part of the city, all on her own on Swiss false papers. Like children can, she found out everything she needed to know. She said, babies should see their moms. So she was taking me there. Grave danger. And as it turned out, that was the day the Gestapo knocked on the door to search my mom's little apartment and we were hidden under the bed. Consequence of that, never quite come out from under that bed. And certainly that's where my memory stopped because uh, we, we must have been uh, scared to death. Uh, my mother talked them away from a search uh, and uh, those Swiss documents helped. So we were safe, but that night we had to come home again after curfew. And Nora has alluded to the fact that other dangerous things happened that evening and she has never told me, would never tell me what they were. So uh, having almost got us all killed, um, uh, she was punished by mother and father and I don't remember what, but thank God, um, she uh, didn't take it too badly because a kid in anger might have done something really irrational. She did not, and uh, she's been a loving sister ever since and is now uh, uh, nearly 92. Her next birthday is 92 years old in, in The Hague where she still lives. Uh, uh, staying with them was a, was a wonderful experience in the sense that they were so kind, uh, but I gradually uh, became uh, apprehensive and knew that there was danger outside because when I looked out the window, uh, I, I saw German soldiers out in the park uh, marching around. Uh, I was pulled away from that window and never told never to go uh, near it again. So... Uh, uh, and that was a simple uh, precaution for me because I was a kid with a mop of black curly hair and easily uh, spotted uh, from across the street where Dutch Nazis were known to be living. And uh, from then on, I was confined to uh, the back of the, their apartment. The, uh, uh, the life was... Uh, was relatively uh, simplistic and felt fairly safe, except that I gradually uh, became more and more aware of uh, possible danger. And uh, don't know exactly how I got that, but it did definitely change my personality from an apparently very exuberant infant uh, to a very quiet and uh, contemplative little boy. I was cooperative. I never complained of illness. I never cried. I did not cry for three years. Uh, I cooperated in everything uh, within the house. My mother, uh, who was a speaker of truth, lied only in order to save me uh, and to save me from uh, uh, feeling badly about uh, the conditions around the house, particularly when food ran out. Uh, we were eating tulip bulbs, and she would tell me that Mine were potatoes. Everyone else was going to eat the tulip bulbs and I would get potatoes. She'd bake them. I'd be eating the tulip bulbs, mealy, mealy uh, bland kind of uh, things. And I would uh, compliment her on uh, the excellent potatoes that she had made for me. Uh, the years passed and liberation came on May 5th, 1945. We went out one day too early, um, uh, assuming that uh, liberation had landed a little earlier, obviously first in the south of Holland, and then gradually crept up to The Hague. Um, the monks took me to see my mother on May 4th in her little apartment. There is another window episode. I go to the window, I'm a curious boy. I look outside just in time to see German half-tracks coming down the street 
pursued by Canadian tanks. From the half-tracks, German soldiers shot the man who had opened his door across the street, dead. I saw him fall. At that moment, I got pulled by the legs back away from the window. Windows weren't doing very well for me. And uh, the next day, May 5th, when liberation uh, really took place, uh, and I was back at the Munichs, and uh, we were uh, celebrating out on the roof. I remember standing on the roof watching British bombers drop white bread. At least that was the rumor, because that was uh, uh, white bread was something that was uh, a luxury not known throughout the war, considered a luxury. Um, that night, there were celebrations on the street, and I was forced to go back to my bed at seven o'clock, which was my uh, always premature bedtime, uh, to my mind. Uh, this time, I protested. I wanted to be out there celebrating with everyone else. I was being denied that. So I cried and yelled about three years worth. That was uh, liberating. Uh, that was the only part of liberation that was liberating the freedom to cry. Uh, because liberation for a Jew is not very liberating. What happened next? Um, my parents came back for me. They had survived the war. This was a miracle. Most Dutch Jewish children did not get their parents back. If they were lucky, one returned. 108,000 Dutch Jews uh, were deported to Auschwitz and so we were. About 5,000 returned at most. Certainly 103,500 are inscribed as having been murdered. So not many kids got their uh, mommies and daddies back, I did. <clears throat> uh, they had one little photo uh, to prove that I was theirs. And uh, this time I cried again, but I went back home with them and I was lucky on the account of the maturity of the adults in my life because my parents and the Munichs became the best of friends and shared me. And I was able to run back and forth between the two homes when I wished and particularly when my parents took a vacation, uh, I would go uh, uh, automatically pack a bag and go and live with Mutter, Father, and Nora. Why was this period of time not liberating for a Dutch Jew? Uh, the Christian community, for the most part, have managed to stay in place. Difficult times, terrible war, hunger, famine. But mostly, intact families remained at the end of it all. Uh, we were destroyed. Our family had been shattered. My mother lost her parents, two brothers and a younger sister. Uh, my father uh, lost his parents and two sisters. And they were the uh, only survivors of their immediate families. Uh, in all, uh, some family has uh, looked into our records and determined that uh, of the Stelzer family, to which I belong, uh, 136 members were murdered. So there was no one left uh, in Holland except uh, my first cousin, uh, Nolly, who stayed with his uh, Dutch hiders. We did not even know where he was. Uh, at the time, his mother placed him just prior to her deportation to Sobibor. Uh, we found him riding his bike in a section of the city that uh, uh, my father and his rescuer, Jacob Oversloat, uh, were searching. Uh, Jacob Oversloat was a, a fur partner of my father's who uh, hid him in his attic uh, with his family of uh, six, his wife and five children. Now we were together again to uh, start life anew in uh, a city that felt like death. Uh, my father would po point out the window where my, of the place my grandmother had lived in and uh, his friends who had been deported uh, did not come back. Uh, there was virtually no one there. Uh, but somehow or other, 
uh, the uh, returning survivors from Auschwitz had uh, known that the Krells did not leave and they came through our living room. I, uh, as a five, six year old, listened to their stories. They were in Yiddish. I would not have understood most of it for two reasons. One, I refused to learn Yiddish. I thought it was German and no one told me it wasn't. And uh, 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 my second cousin, Millie, Millie Stelzer, who was nine years old, came back from Switzerland where they had fled. And she spoke all languages. She became my translator and we heard stories that no children should ever hear. Uh, but we listened. And uh, although I can't speak Yiddish because I always had refused to, to learn it, uh, it left me able to read German newspapers. And uh, uh, before I traveled to Israel, I dreamed in Yiddish. We spent uh, the next uh, five years in Holland and uh, uh, grew restless. My parents went to Israel to check it out for uh, us to make Aliyah. Uh, changed their minds. My dad was a furrier. He said they had a difficulty selling fur coats uh, to Bedouins in the Negev. And, uh, uh, but I suspect that they really didn't want to go because they knew I would have to go to the army immediately, their only son. And, and uh, uh, they didn't want to uh, uh, go through another war. Uh, they looked into the United States and received visas and gave them to uh, Jacob Overslow to his family because they wanted to immigrate uh, to America. And then finally, we got visas uh, to Canada. Uh, we came directly to Vancouver, five weeks on the Deemer deck from Rotterdam through the Panama Canal, a wonderful trip for a 10-year-old kid, and uh, landed in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, a very choice place. I recognized, I was the most eager immigrant on earth. Uh, I recognized the possibilities uh, of living in Vancouver immediately. And while my parents were somewhat de depressed, I was anything but. Uh, it was exciting within a very short while. I had a paper and I was earning money and uh, uh, made good friends in and around the neighborhood and uh, led for, for, for what for me was an ideal life. Uh, I was blessed with uh, the best of friends through my adolescence. Uh, the only thing that I didn't know very much about was being a Jew. That was complicated. After the war, I uh, was enrolled in a Catholic kindergarten. I was the absolute best student. Um, as attested to by the mother superior, uh, I've rethought that. I don't think that I was the best student particularly, but I was the best candidate for conversion. And that's why she kept me so close. And uh, uh, I received pictures of uh, Jesus every day to take home, which my uh, father duly posted in the bathroom because he said there he could be seen by everyone. It, uh, it was complicated to, uh, to uh, be raised as a Catholic after Protestantism and uh, now facing Judaism when suddenly my parents got me a Hebrew teacher. Don't know where he came from or how it happened, but I was getting Hebrew lessons from Mr. Krakauer and uh, I did badly. Uh, I was a good student in school. So I don't know why I did badly, but I figured out later in life that uh, learning doesn't play, take place when a uh, man who was in a concentration camp and a little boy in hiding uh, are figuring out which one of them is more depressed. I learned little. And I still had difficulty uh, reading Hebrew. The, uh, the uh, Judaism uh, that my parents experienced as uh, Orthodox young Jews uh, was gone and uh, their ambivalence spilled over into me and I not, never really got clarification of what it meant to be a Jew other than the Auschwitz stories. Uh, I thought my destiny was to die in a concentration camp. 
in, in Canada, I had the good fortune of uh, joining Habonim, the labor Zionist organization, and going to camp. And uh, it gave me the kind of Judaism I needed uh, in the form of an attachment to love of Israel, uh, which I have visited many, many times. And my wife, Marilyn, and I lived in Jerusalem for six months as well. So uh, my Judaism came back against great odds. At age 12, my father took me to the synagogue and he said, uh, he said, I take you here because my father took me to shul, uh, but uh, don't expect to see me ever pray. And he didn't. Two things he didn't do. He didn't pray and he did not set foot in the Jewish cemetery, even when friends passed. Uh, we visited, I, I remember touring Europe with, uh, with him and we saw all kinds of graves uh, uh, near Rome and Milan and other places. Um, he visited those uh, for uh, their sculptural beauty, but uh, but a Jewish cemetery he would not uh, he would not touch. In uh, Canada, um, I made those decisions for myself. I don't know exactly what went into this, but I recall at age eleven or twelve realizing I was on my own. Uh, particularly one day when my dad visited me at Camp Miriam and said that he was broke. Our, all our money was, what little money we had taken with, with us was gone. Uh, he had to uh, switch jobs from being a furrier and uh, write his real estate exams and uh, became a realtor and relatively successful at that. Um, but those were tough times. Uh, not for me, I felt sorry for him to work so hard. I felt sorry for my mom, but I sure didn't feel sorry for myself. Uh, everything was uh, everything was possible to do, and uh, I worked hard at school. I, uh, oh, I was put back as an immigrant for not knowing English for a year, and then they never allowed me to uh, catch up, so I uh, found out what the rules were, and I skipped grade 11 to get my year back. I thought I was going on Havodim workshop to Israel, uh, but then I changed my mind to uh, use that year to uh, start university at the right time for me and uh, got my medical degree from UBC in 1965. The, uh, uh, my graduation was momentous. Uh, uh, my parents arranged for the Oversloats to come up from Los Angeles where they had settled. They were in Altadena, California and uh, my mother and father from Holland. And so that was wonderful. I uh, went off to uh, Philadelphia uh, uh, to do my internship at the uh, Philadelphia General Hospital, uh, then psychiatry at Temple University Hospital and child psychiatry at uh, Stanford. And I came back home to look after my parents. Uh, I was given many opportunities to work in Philadelphia and actually a, a possible professorship at Stanford. Uh, but I felt like a second generation individual, the child of survivors who is responsible um, for keeping his family together and well. Uh, so I returned uh, as they were getting older. And uh, in 1956, uh, my mother at age 40, maybe 41, um, had another baby, my brother Ron, who is 15 years younger than I. I was much like a father to him, uh, taking him to sports events and playing sports with him, which is something my father never did with me. Uh, so we were a family of four at that time. And, uh, and, uh, I settled into Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, met Marilyn, had a, uh, a wonderful wedding, I would say about four of the 400 guests, about 360 would have been her family, who, her family's family, uh, who had been in Vancouver since the turn of the century. Uh, and ours of about 40, 
but it included Mutter and father. Uh, Mutter surprised me, a shy woman, uh, reserved, monolingual, speaking just Dutch, got up in front of 400 people and uh, said she wanted to speak. So I translated. Basically what she said was, I don't know what the Holocaust was, just that it was an awful thing. But to me, the Holocaust was God's way of giving me a son. So there you are, now you know. In 1971, <clears throat> I became an assistant professor of psychiatry at UBC and things began to happen. I was very busy directing a child and family psychiatry clinic at UBC, getting paid poorly and therefore allowed a small private practice. And within the framework of my small private practice, the Holocaust survivors of Vancouver began to bring their children to me made sense actually, Jewish psychiatrist, one who was part of a survivor family. He would understand, he would understand differently. And I discovered that what they really wanted was my silence. They didn't want to be questioned about the possibility that they'd contribute something to the struggles of their children. These children all had the same problem as any other Canadian children, depressions and ADHD, learning disabilities, uh, but the specter of the Holocaust lived on in their families, as it did in my life. And, uh, and uh, working with Holocaust families, gradually the survivors stayed with me for, in quotes, therapy. Why in quotes? Uh, I've never claimed to do therapy with survivors. I have been a good companion with respect to them telling their stories. And from them and those stories, I've learned pretty well everything that I know. And conventional psychiatry can't touch it. Their depressions could be relieved, some with medications and some other associated symptomatology. You don't heal the Holocaust. You live with it or beside it. And they showed me how to do that how they did it. It was really quite remarkable. And I began to write a little bit about it. And then with two or three other interested people decided the Holocaust was simply too large an event to ignore and that it should be taught. And uh, the three of us founded the uh, Holocaust Education Symposium for high school students in British Columbia, which has until COVID run for about 40 years or so, and will resume shortly. The, uh, the Holocaust Symposium uh, uh, led me to invite uh, survivors to speak. Uh, I placed a fair bit of pressure on them, they tell me now, uh, but I thought it was important for them to do so not from an educational standpoint alone, but from a healing point of view. And all those who have been involved with us say that it is the best thing that they have done with their lives, even though it caused them great grief at certain points. They became our speakers. I then founded an audiovisual testimony project in 1978 well before Spielberg. No money, but I had two large cameras in the Department of Psychiatry's audiovisual studios. And there I began to interview uh, survivors for testimonies that uh, I deposited later with the Holocaust Education Center when I built that and uh, uh, with uh, the Yale archives of audiovisual testimonies now called the uh, Fortune of archives. So there was an education program, there was audiovisual testimony. And then uh, a momentous thing happened uh, that I promised to tell you about with respect to memory. 
I went to the 1981 World Gathering of Jewish Holocaust survivors in Jerusalem. There were 5,000 survivors there. I was there with uh, my mother and Nora. Father had passed away. Uh, mother and Nora were uh, inducted uh, to Yad Vashem in the ceremony for the righteous. Uh, my own parents were there and we were all sitting, listening to the first introductory talks. And Rabbi Israel Meyer Lau said something like this. I may be paraphrasing, but this is the essence. My name is Rabbi Israel Meyer Lau. I'm the chief rabbi of the Tanya. My father was the chief rabbi of Piotrovsk, and my and he died in Treblinka. My mother died in Ravensbrück, and I was the youngest survivor at age eight of Buchenwald. Now there were others apparently a little younger, but he thought he was the youngest. Age eight. My God. I was five in 45, he was eight in 45. Nolly, my cousin, was six and a half in 45. Millie was nine. We were child survivors. We had been skipped. How did that happen? After the war, not that long after the war, the survivors organized themselves, particularly those who had been in concentration camps. And their children, the second generation, I, I was uh, attending various conferences uh, in the late 70s in New York and LA participating as a child of survivors, which I was. I had not conceived of myself as being a child Holocaust survivor. And it turned out no one else had either. So in 1982, when I took a sabbatical at the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute, I would go over to the Simon Wiesenthal Center and work there. Rabbi Heyer, who uh, founded that center, was the rabbi who uh, married Marilyn and myself. Uh, and he gave me an office there to work in, uh, which I liked much better than uh, over in the hospital. And uh, gave a lecture on Holocaust families. I think the week after Sarah Moskowitz gave her lecture on a book she was writing called Love Despite Hate, Children of the Holocaust and Their Adult Lives. Uh, we became a team and we together founded the Child Survivor Movement of Los Angeles, which I am told eventually grew to 500 members. Child survivors were on the map. That was started in 1983. Uh, in 1987, Stephanie, uh, Stephanie Seltzer, um, back east, uh, held a conference at Lancaster in Pennsylvania of child survivors that she knew and had gathered. And uh, there was steam behind the movement such that in 1991, we held the ADL Hidden Child Conference in New York, where 1,600 uh, uh, persons attended, uh, primarily uh, child survivors. There we talked about how we were uh, silenced and how our memories were not taken seriously. In fact, older survivors and to their everlasting shame, mental health professionals said, you were lucky to be a child, you have no memories. No greater nonsense has ever been spoken by mental health professionals. Well, maybe so, but um, uh, the reason that it is nonsense, of course, was these momentous things that were happening, uh, of course, caused memories. They were fragmented. They were not very well organized. They may not have been a proper sequence, um, but they were there haunting us. And uh, the child survivor movement grew and we uh, had in 2019, the 31st annual conference of the World Federation of Jewish Child Holocaust Survivors and their descendants here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, so for 31 years, uh, these conferences were healing. So when I think in terms of uh, therapy as a child psychiatrist, uh, those were the healing 
um, vehicles needed for some measure of comfort to develop. It was uh, participating in Holocaust education, offering testimony and gathering with like-minded people uh, where we understood each other and ourselves better. I've written about that and I think you were shown the book that uh, are my reflections uh, as offered in keynote speeches to the annual uh, child survivor movements. I'll close with this and hope uh, that you will join me in discussion and perhaps pose some questions. So the Holocaust, uh, we know, was the pivotal event of the uh, middle of the last century. I think that uh, it is so important uh, to study it because no aspect of our lives was untouched, even those who are undereducated and don't know of it uh, are being touched by the Holocaust. And I see it in this manner. There is almost no one who did not participate in the perversion of their professions and their thinking during the time of Nazi domination. Doctors participated, doctors of the most sophisticated kind that existed in Germany at that time. Uh, lawyers changed laws to the Nuremberg laws. It only took two years from 1933 to 35. The two professions that are meant to safeguard our lives in many ways, doctors and lawyers um, uh, bought in. Philosophers, Heidegger, and others come to mind, uh, architects built gas chambers, doctors refined the mechanisms by which people were to die en masse. The, uh, the uh, common folk as described by Christopher Browning in Ordinary Men, there was no one who was untouched what are the implications for that in the immediate present? Uh, it, it means that our medical schools and law schools should be teaching about what happened at the Holocaust to prevent sliding down the path. Uh, philosophy, literature, theology can no longer be taught as it was before the Holocaust. It has to change, it has to adapt to that monstrous event that was perpetrated as well by the, theologians uh, and, philosoph and philosophers and others we uh, generally de deem to be uh, academics uh, who have no particular direct uh, involvement in uh, politics and certainly the politics of racism. Uh, we must be watchful. Uh, the other uh, thing that comes to mind is uh, simply uh, my involvements over the years. Uh, I was told sometimes that I was obsessed with the Holocaust. My response was that the Holocaust is obsessed with me. Uh, it would not let me go. Uh, there were signs and reminders everywhere. Uh, there was only one way to deal with it. That was through it, not to avoid it. And uh, uh, like so many things, Elie Wiesel clarified this for me. Uh, I was his uh, friend since 1978, and we had an opportunity to talk, and I always felt uh, so supported by him, and particularly the manner in which he uh, lent support. And that was uh, his um, very apt uh, description of the burners of 1.5 million children. He would say, Ellie would say, um, what is the meaning of the murder of 1.5 million children? There is no meaning, it is meaningless. He says, but we must confer meaning on it. And so I'm beginning to see my life into my early eighties as uh, my own attempt to uh, to confer meaning upon meaninglessness. 
Thank you. Wow. I mean, that was Dr. Krell. Thank you for that. I, I'm, I'm beyond words is what I am for all of your insights and for, for even the approach that you've taken with sharing your hair and experience, but then also how you've kind of come to terms with it. I, I do have a couple of questions for you if Please. you're prepared. Absolutely. Thank you. So you've talked a lot about your, the importance of the story, of the testimony, but based on your experiences sharing both yours, but others also other Holocaust survivor testimonies, how do you think the sharing of that testimony impacts the mental health of the individuals and does the individual testimony, is it beneficial to the survivor community as a whole? You can talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I'm, a, I'm a very strong advocate and believer uh, you know, that uh, that survivor who tells uh, the story, particularly uh, in print or as audiovisual testimony, um, is greatly relieved by being unburdened from carrying it around in his or her head all the time, because it is there all the time. The triggers at any given day, okay, are absolutely astronomical. One only has to turn on the news, uh, particularly in these times of Ukraine, but any other time, uh, to watch disasters at the, the say the border, uh, the border of uh, the United States and Mexico, of children being thrown over a wall. You know what that does to a child survivor to see those images again? It leaves them, you know. So, so uh, I think what, whatever is possible to, in a sense, unburden, but in the process and service of teaching, of educating others, is a very, very valuable road to better mental health. And I've had this confirmed over and over. At the beginning when I started, it was considered pretty dangerous. Um, you know, territory, dangerous territory. This, that, that was the reason why survivors were not well treated by psychiatrists. Psychiatrists said the, psychi the survivors would not talk. They're in denial. Nonsense. The survivors were not invited to talk because the mental health professionals were not prepared to listen. They did not want to join them in the abyss of that knowledge. They were in denial. That's a very fair point. What led you specifically into, oh, I guess, let me rephrase that. Do you believe that your childhood experiences as, as a child Holocaust survivor helped guide you into a field of psychiatry, specifically child psychiatry? Actually, actually, no. I thought. Okay. My mother, as I told you, wonderful woman. But, you know, um, only mod modestly educated, right? Um, she she uh, had a much more important kind of intelligence. It was speaking truth. It's gotten me into a lot of trouble. And she imparted some of that to me. But she spoke truth. And what, she's, what she said one day was, well, it looks to me like you're a Jewish child uh, who was saved to help other children. So I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, you should be a doctor of children. And she wasn't sophisticated enough to, to know that there was even a, a uh, specialty like child psychiatry. She was obviously thinking of, about pediatrics. Right, just like my head of pediatrics said to me when I came back as a child psychiatrist, he said, "Oh, your pediatrician got wrong." Um, so she had that in mind, and that must have made an impact. I'm therefore also the only child of two mothers, where one is Jewish, where the non-Jewish one wanted me to be a doctor. So, uh, yes, there was something there planted there. But I didn't know it because I didn't, I didn't even decide to go into psychiatry until the middle of my internship. So now that you have chosen this, this path, 
do you believe that your experiences as in your formative years are helping your ability to help children throughout your career who also may have gone through traumatic experiences or things like that? Well, I, I, I think so in this sense is that I, I, because I trust my memory from two and a half, I trust theirs from two and a half. And in fact, what I would see a child of eight or nine who denied knowing anything or remembering anything, I was quite confident I could get them back to age two and a half and three to talk about things. So if you if you begin from, uh, you know, that direction, you're more likely to be headed for success. So since in child psychiatry, you always face, almost always face children who have been traumatized. You can assume it's there. And therefore, it's just a matter of figuring out how to get to it. It's through play, for example, through storytelling to check it out. But I, I was always very fairly confident, unlike others, that it was sitting there. And I think that definitely shows in, in the work that you've done throughout your career. Looking ahead, what do you think is the most important message to communicate to to young people, both children, but also young people or adults for that matter, today? And what do you think is the most effective way to share that message? To learn from the past, to not repeat it, but as you said, to also deal with things that are happening right now in our own world. That's a beautiful question. Very complicated answer, probably. So let me simplify. Um, I, I just, I was going to say I despair. I don't despair. It's another thing that Elie Wiesel taught us, right? Jews don't despair. Jews hope. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, I, I'm sad to know that what we learned or should be learning from the Holocaust is not contemporary teaching in the professions. So, what, what, what should we try to do in the future is to introduce uh, the ever increasing knowledge about those terrible events and translate them to contemporary life. Watch out for this, watch out for that. These are things that can happen to a human being. You can be corrupted, you can be perverted to join in this. Examine what you're going to do next in your research, examine how much this will hurt a person rather than heal them. That would be in, for a physician, in the law, protecting the rights of your clients, you know, and the manner in which is done. Um, the law in human rights, these are such important things. How, how, how could you become a a lawyer and work in human rights without studying the Holocaust. I'm, I, I do believe it happens that people go through their entire law learning without any reference to the Nuremberg laws. You can already see it now, the, 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 uh, the, the absence of knowledge. To me, the, the, the International Court of Justice for which I had such great hopes looks like a, a shambles uh, because they have not absorbed the lessons of the Holocaust, nor, nor for that matter, Rwanda, Cambodia, you know. Um, I, I think that that's the, it's part of the curriculum of, of, of your life. And theologians, my God, how can you possibly ever become a Christian theologian without knowing? about the Holocaust. I think those are very profound words. And, you know, Dr. Krell, I want to thank you so much for sharing all of this with us today. For all of us on this call, I know I speak for every single one of us and those that will watch it later, you are absolutely compelling to listen to and, and fascinating, even for myself as an educator of this topic. I learn things every time that I'm you know, inspired by again and again. I want to introduce you very briefly to our president and CEO, Michael Levitt. I know he's also dying to say a couple of words to you as well. Mm -hmm. and he's here on the call too. Michael? Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you. Make sure I'm not muted. Everybody can hear me. There we go. 
Um, Dr. Quell, usually when I do one of these wrap ups, I'm, I'm fairly brief, but I've actually, I didn't want to interrupt Daniela, but I've, I've got a question um, because on the issue of trauma uh, on youth experiencing the type of things that you experience and you talked about. So I got back last night from Poland um, and I guess a day and a half ago, I was in the, the border uh, at Medica at the uh, Polish-Ukrainian border and um, maybe 10 minutes from there is the first of uh, one of the really large centers that's accommodating on a temporary basis, providing temporary shelter. It's actually an old Tesco supermarket that's been uh, just filled up with mattresses. And I was absolutely struck, and, and it's only when you, I wasn't planning on raising this, but when you were talking about it, I. I was there and we were, I was there with a, a relief effort and we were taking into places like that, water, chocolate, kinder, kinder eggs for the kids. Mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't get over and it's haunting me, um, the look on some of their faces, almost uh, you know, a, a trance state, particularly I'll tell you, I took note of it with some of the older kids, with some of the adolescents, uh, 12, 13 and up, who were kind of sitting on their mattresses and just really kind of looking blindly. And, and I, I just, I, I wonder, and I, I'm so concerned because, you know, there, there's barely um, the uh, assistance on hand to provide them the blanket and the water mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. mattress. Certainly any notion of getting um, counseling uh, uh, to them in any time, anytime soon is going to be heavily problematic. Uh, what, what do you think are the possibilities? Again, we're talking about kids that have had to flee their homes um, in the middle of the night, leaving fathers behind, of course, no males age 18 to 60 are allowed to travel. And the moms are also, you know, very, many of them very devastated. Some of them weren't and were able to, you know, talk and have conversations and some of the kids played, we played soccer with them and did other things inside that yeah. center. But I, I'm really am the, the, the look on some of the faces and the clear pain and suffering that they're going to, what do we do here? What are the, what are the prospects for being able to, as a, a society, um, uh, provide some kind of relief, you know, if not now down the line? No, the, these are, these are such important questions. And, uh, because what you're seeing is mass trauma in formation. Yeah. Uh, you know right now that no, none of these children will be able to ever forget being uprooted uh, under fear of death with bombings and not knowing whether their fathers are still alive even now. And uh, my God, their preoccupations from this massive assault on everything uh, that was their security and predictability, right, is destroyed. Uh, what do you do in the face of that? Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, and this, this is always kind of fascinated me, is that uh, in the 1920s and 30s, uh, the, uh, there was an intense focus on psychoanalysis and really intensive treatment. And they got pretty yeah. excited about any uh, bedwetter that they could find for five years of psychoanalysis, you know, as a symptom. In other words, a symptom deserved the most intensive treatment that was available at the time. When we came out in 1945, there was no one to be seen. Okay, well, they were obviously okay with bedwetters, but they weren't with multiply traumatized children for three, four, five, if you were a Polish Jewish child made it to 1945, you had six years. Right. Six years under the Nazi boot of fear of death, right? 1.5 million killed, Jewish children killed, 90% of all European Jewish children were murdered. Uh, so, so the 10% that were left, what did they have to what do they have to go through in order to make it out the other end? So here you've got a capsule, a capsulated period, encapsulated period of time. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Um, uh, of children within a week or so 
who have had visited upon them every possible trauma that you could imagine, short of, short of what I would say the Jewish children did not have, which is um, the possibility of safety and security at the other end. Only right. death did it for them, yeah. right? Those trains were not comfortable. The Jewish deportation trains were not. No. So that's the only the only privilege in their madness that they have had is that they've they've got receptive hands to receive the, the, the gas chambers. That's right. It's already, to my mind, a great improvement. Yeah. They don't feel it's an improvement because this is the worst thing that could ever have happened to them and visit them right now. So you would imagine, you would imagine that from learning from those other experiences, particularly the absence of competent mental health professionals for the Jewish children, say in DP camps after the war, that these places now would be swarming with, with assistance. Right. Sophisticated social work, psychology people, you know, bringing these children who are staring vacantly, we know exactly what they're vacantly staring into, to bring them out over time. Now, to begin to talk with them, to say, you must be thinking about your father and whether he's well or not. Why is there no one there to ask that question? Rather than saying everything will be okay. All right? That's what therapy yep. is about. That's the, 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 the assistance to talk about what, what, what seems untalkable. You must not speak of this. Yes, you must. This is the time to speak about what the options are, possibility. God forbid he doesn't come back. Then what do we do? Well, let's face that when it comes. So, yes. And did, uh, and did you see the mental health professionals? No. No, there, there, there definitely wasn't. And, and again, um, maybe when they're taken on from there, they're there a couple of days. Um, and then, you know, in Krakow, I was at, at, at other centers uh, that, that are, you know, some of them are a, a little bit better conditioned. Some are ending up in homes. I, I visited a, a Polish woman's home who had taken in uh, six or seven families in this tiny little farmhouse over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I actually met... Uh, there was a maybe a 12 or 13 year old uh, child there, boy there with his mom. And I had a long conversation with the mom. And she just said, you know, I, I, her, her biggest fear, obviously, is for her husband. And the son came down and, you know, and we, and we chatted a little bit. His English was quite good. He, uh, he helped get my phone working again. Um, but it's, I mean, it's going to be a long haul. And uh, I didn't and, see any of right that now, on the ground. But. And right now, it's, it's a, an extraordinary scramble right yeah. just to get some food on the table and a decent night's sleep and that but immediately after those basics are taken care of these families must be connected to people who can guide kind of guide them through life whether they end up in poland or in canada somebody somebody must have the seichel the sense right to say Okay, now that you're eating okay and you're beginning to sleep without too many nightmares, you know. Right. Let's get them the get them the help they need. Let's work on your. Okay. So sorry, I just I took up an extra ten minutes there. Um, I really want to thank you for your incredible um uh, talk for 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 joining us here today. I was you know fascinated in the way that your your life, your own journey has inspired your life's work. And, uh, you know, that that's, uh, comes through in the passion that you have for what went on in the past, but for also the work and, and what you've been able to achieve in helping so many other child survivors, giving them a voice um, through, you know, what you've, what you've been doing. And again, your, your, uh, your, your career. Um, if I may, if I, if I may, my publisher keeps sure. reminding me, okay, <laughs> if anyone is, is interested in learning more, I, I have some details about the psychiatry part and some trauma and things like that in, in a book called Sounds from Silence. I just published it last year. 
I'll make sure that everybody, Thanks. when I send out the link um, for the video, we'll I'll make sure link. I'll send a link to the book as well if people want to purchase it. And, and I just want to also thank um, the team, the education team at FSWC, uh, Daniela and Elena, and I think Melissa's on here somewhere, uh, and Ariel and Kim, uh, and of course our partners at the Rural Wallenberg Center. Um, I spoke to Irwin this morning on my drive into work, and, and he's under the weather, but he did want me to pass on his, uh, his sincere appreciation for you participating in this, uh, Dr. Krell, and uh, to everybody again that, that comes back um, every two weeks, I was going to say week after week, every two weeks to join us. Um, thank you so much, and uh, we will keep making sure we have speakers um, as enthralling as Dr. Krell was today. Thank you, everyone.